Please join me in welcoming Cheryl Sandberg. Thank you. Thank you, Catherine. It's an honor to be here today to address HBS's distinguished faculty, proud parents, patient guests, and most importantly, the class of 2012. Today was supposed to be a day of unbridled celebration, and I know that's no longer true. I join all of you in grieving for your classmate, Nate. I know there are no words that make something like this better. Although laden with sadness, today still marks a distinct and impressive achievement for this class. So please, everyone join me in giving our warmest congratulations to the class of 2012. When the wonderful Dean Noria invited me to speak here today, I thought, come talk to a group of people way younger and cooler than I am. I can do that. I do that every day at Facebook. <laughs> and I like being surrounded by young people, except when they say to me, what was it like being in college without the internet? Or worse, Cheryl, can you come here? We need to see what old people are going to think of this feature. <laughs> oh, I'm not joking. It's a special privilege for me to be here this month. When I was a student here 17 years ago, I studied social marketing with Professor Cash Rangan. And one of the many examples Cash used to explain the concept of social marketing was the lack of organ donors in this country, which kills 18 people every single day. Earlier this month, Facebook, Facebook launched a tool to support organ donations, something that stems directly from Cash's work. Cash, wherever you are here, we're all grateful for your dedication. So it wasn't really that long ago when I was sitting where you are, but the world has changed an awful lot. My section, Section B, tried to have HBS's first online class. We had to use an AOL chat room and dial-up service your parents can explain to you later what dial-up service is. <laughs> we had to pass out a list of our screen names because it was unthinkable to put your real name on the internet. And it never worked. It kept crashing and kicking all of us off because the world just wasn't set up for 90 people to communicate at once online. For a few brief moments, though, we glimpsed the future, a future where technology would power who we are, and connect us to our real colleagues, our real family, our real friends. It used to be that in order to reach more people than you could talk to in a day, you had to be rich and famous and powerful, be a celebrity, a politician, a CEO. But that's not true today. Now ordinary people have voice, not just those of us lucky enough to go to HBS but anyone with access to Facebook, to Twitter, to a mobile phone. This is disrupting traditional power structures and leveling traditional hierarchy. Voice and power are shifting from institutions to individuals, from the historically powerless to the histori historically powerful to the historically powerless. And all of this is happening so much faster than I could have ever imagined when I was sitting where you are today and Mark Zuckerberg was 11 years old. <laughs> As the world becomes more connected and less hierarchical, traditional career paths are shifting as well. In 2001, after working in the government, I moved out to Silicon Valley to try to find a job. My timing wasn't really that good. The bubble had crashed, small companies were closing, big companies were laying people off. One woman CEO looked at me and said, we would never even think about hiring someone like you. After a while, I had a few offers, and I had to make a decision. So what did I do? I'm MBA trained. I made a spreadsheet. And I listed my jobs in the columns and the things that my criteria in the rows and compared the companies and the missions and the roles. One of the jobs on that sheet was to become Google's first business unit general manager, which sounds good now. But at the time, no one thought consumer internet companies could ever make money. 
I was not sure that there was actually a job there at all. Google had no business unit, so what was there to generally manage? And the job was several levels lower than jobs I was being offered at other companies. So I sat down with Eric Schmidt, who had just become the CEO, and I showed him my spreadsheet, and I said, this job meets none of my criteria. He put his hand on my sheet, and he looked at me and he said, don't be an idiot. Excellent career advice. <laughs> and then he said, get on a rocket ship. When companies are growing quickly and they're having a lot of impact, careers take care of themselves. And when companies aren't growing quickly or the missions don't matter as much, that's when stagnation and politics come in. If you're offered a seat on a rocket ship, don't ask what seat, just get on. About six and a half years later, when I was leaving Google, I took that advice to heart. I was offered CEO jobs at a bunch of companies, but I went to Facebook as COO. At the time, people said, why are you going to work for a 23-year-old? The traditional metaphor for careers is a ladder, but I no longer think that metaphor holds. It doesn't make sense in a less hierarchical world. When I was first at Facebook, a woman named Lori Goler, a 1997 graduate of HBS, was working in marketing at eBay, and I knew her kind of socially, and she called me and she said, I want to think about, you know, talk to you about coming to work with you at Facebook. So I thought about calling you and telling you all the things I'm good at and all the things I like to do, but I figured that everyone's doing that. So instead, I want to know, what's your biggest problem and how can I solve it? My jaw hit the floor. I've hired thousands of people up to that point in my career, but no one had ever said anything like that, and I had never said anything like that. Job searches are always about the job searcher, but not in Lori's case. I said, you're hired, my biggest problem is recruiting, and you can solve it. So Lori changed fields into something she never thought she'd do, went down a level to start in a new field, and has since been promoted and runs all of the people operations at Facebook and is doing an extraordinary job, having amazing impact. Lori has a great metaphor for careers. She says they're not a ladder, they're a jungle gym. As you start your post-HBS career, look for opportunities. Look for growth, look for impact, look for mission. Move sideways, move down, move on, move off. Build your skills, not your resume. Evaluate what you can do, not the title they're going to give you. Do real work. Take a sales quota, a line roll, an ops job. Don't plan too much, and don't expect a direct climb. If I had mapped out my career when I was sitting where you are, I would have missed my career. You are entering a different business world than I entered. Mine was just starting to get connected. Yours is hyper-connected. Mine was competitive. Yours is way more competitive. Mine moved quickly. Yours moves even more quickly. As traditional structures are breaking down, leadership has to evolve as well. From hierarchy to shared responsibility, from command and control to listening and guiding. You've been trained by this great institution not just to be part of these trends, but to lead. As you lead in this new world, you will not be able to rely on who you are or the degree you hold. You'll have to rely on what you know. Your strength will not come from your place on some org chart. Your strength will come from building trust and earning respect. You're going to need talent and skill and imagination and vision. But more than anything else, you're going to need the ability to communicate authentically, to speak so that you inspire the people around you, and to listen so that you continue to learn each and every day on the job. If you watch young children, you'll immediately notice how honest they are. My friend Betsy in my section a few years after business school was pregnant with her second child. And her first child, Sam, was about five. And he looked at her and said, Mommy, where's the baby? And she said, well, the baby's in my tummy. And he said, really, aren't the baby's arms in your arms? And she said, no, the baby's in my tummy. Really, are the baby's legs in your legs? No, whole baby's in my tummy. And he said, mommy, then what is growing in your butt?
as adults, we are never this honest, and that is not a bad thing. I have borne two children. The last thing I needed were those comments, which obviously could have been made. But it's not always a good thing either, because all of us, and especially leaders, need to speak and hear the truth. The workplace is an especially difficult place for anyone to tell the truth. Because no matter how flat we want our organizations to be, all organizations have some form of hierarchy. And what that means is that one person's performance is assessed by someone else's perception. This is not a setup for honesty. Think about how people speak in the typical workforce. Rather than say, I disagree with our expansion strategy, or better yet, this seems truly stupid, they say, well, I think there are many good reasons why we're entering this new line of business, and I'm certain the management team has done a thorough ROI analysis. I'm not sure we fully considered the downstream effects of taking this step forward at this time. As we would say at Facebook or on the internet, three letters, WTF. <laughs> Truth is better served by using simple language. Last year, Mark decided to learn Chinese. And as part of studying, he would spend an hour or so each week with some of our employees who are native Chinese speakers. One day, one of them was trying to tell him something about his, her manager. So she said this long sentence, and he said, simpler, please. And then she said it again, and he said, no, no, I still don't understand. Simpler, please. And so on and so on. Finally, in sheer exasperation, she bursts out, my manager is bad. <laughs> Simple and clear and super important for him to know. People rarely speak this clearly in the workforce or in life. And as you get more senior, not only will people speak less clearly to you, but they'll overreact to small things you say. When I joined Facebook, one of the things I had to do was build a business side of the company, put some systems into place, but I wanted to do it without destroying the culture that made Facebook great. And so one of the things I tried to do was encourage people not to do formal PowerPoint presentations for meetings with me. And I would say things like, don't do PowerPoint presentations for meetings with me. Why don't you come in with a list of what you want to discuss? But everyone ignored me, and they kept doing their PowerPoint presentations, meeting after meeting, month after month. So about two years in, I said, OK, I hate rules, but I have a rule. No more PowerPoint in my meetings, and I mean it. No more. So about a month later, I went out and I was about to speak to our global sales comp team on a big stage and someone came up to me and said, before you get on that stage, you really should know everyone's pretty upset about the no PowerPoint with clients thing. And I said, what no PowerPoint with clients thing? They said, you know, you made a rule, no PowerPoint. So I got on the stage and said, one, I meant no PowerPoint with me, but two, more importantly, next time you hear something that's really stupid, don't adhere to it. Fight it or ignore it, even if you think it's coming from me or Mark. A good leader recognizes that most people won't feel comfortable challenging authority, so it falls upon authority to encourage them to question. It's easy to say that you're going to encourage feedback, but it's hard to do because, unfortunately, it doesn't always come in the format we want to hear it. When I first started at Google, I had a team of four people. And it was really important to me that I interview everyone who was on my team. It felt like being part of my team meant I had to know you. When the team had gotten to about 100 people, I realized it was taking longer to schedule my interviews. So one day in my meeting of just my direct reports, I said, maybe I should stop interviewing, fully expecting them to jump in and say, oh no, your interviews are a critical part of the process. They applauded. And then they fell all over themselves explaining that I was, you know, the bottleneck of all time. I was embarrassed, and then I was angry. And I spent a few hours just quietly fuming. Why didn't they tell me I was a bottleneck? Why did they let me go on slowing them down? And then I realized that if they hadn't told me, that was my fault. I hadn't been open enough, told them I wanted that feedback. And I would have to change that going forward. When you're the leader, it is really hard to get good feedback and honest feedback, no matter how many times you ask for it. One trick I've discovered is I try to speak really openly about the things I'm bad at, because that gives people permission to agree with me, which is a lot easier than pointing it out in the first place. So to take one of many possible examples, when things are unresolved, 
I can get a tad anxious. Really, when anything's unresolved, I get a lot anxious. I'm quite certain no one has ever accused me of being too calm. So I speak about it openly, and that gives people permission to tell me when it's happening. But if I never said anything, would anyone who work at face, works at Facebook walk up to me and say, and say, hey, Cheryl, calm down. You're driving us all nuts. I don't think so. As you graduate today, ask yourselves, how will you lead? Will you use simple and clear language? Will you seek out honest feedback? When you get honest feedback, will you react with anger or with gratitude? As we strive to be more authentic in our communication, we should also strive to be more authentic in a broader sense. I talk a lot about bringing your whole self to work, something I believe in very deeply. Motivation comes from working on things we care about, but it also comes from working with people we care about. And in order to care about someone, you have to know them. You have to know what they love and hate, what they feel, not just what they think. If you want to win hearts and minds, you have to lead with your heart as well as your mind. I don't believe we have a professional self for Mondays through Fridays and a real self for the rest of the time. That kind of division probably never worked, but in today's world of real voice and authentic voice, it makes even less sense. I've cried at work. I've told people I've cried at work, and this got reported in the press as Sheryl Sandberg cried on Mark Zuckerberg's shoulder, which is not exactly what happened. <laughs> I talk about my hopes and fears, and I ask people about theirs. I try to be myself, honest about my strengths and weaknesses, and I encourage others to do the same. It is all professional, and it is all personal, all at the very same time. As part of bringing my whole self to work, I recently started speaking up about the challenges women face in the workforce, something I only had the courage to do in the last few years. Before this, I did my career like everyone else does it. I never told anyone I was a girl. Don't tell. I left the lights on when I went home, to do something for my kids. I locked my office door and pumped milk for my babies while I was on conference calls. And people would say, what is that sound? I'd say, what sound? I hear a beep. Oh, there's a fire truck, really, right outside my office. But the lack of progress, progress we've made in the past decade has convinced me that we need to start talking about this. I graduated from HBS in 1995, and I thought it was completely clear that by the time someone from my year was invited to speak at this podium, we would have achieved equality in the workforce. But women at the top C-level jobs is stuck at 15 or 16 percent and has not moved in a decade. Not even close to 50 percent and worse, no longer growing. We need to acknowledge openly that gender remains an issue at the highest levels of leadership. The promise of equality is not equality. We need to start talking about this. We need to start talking about how women underestimate their abilities compared to men. And for women, but not men, success and likability are negatively correlated. That means that as a woman is more successful in your workplaces, she will be less liked. This means that women need a different form of management and mentorship a different form of sponsorship and encouragement, and some protection, in some ways more than men. And there aren't enough senior women out there to do it, so it falls upon the men who are graduating today just as much or more as the women, not just to talk about gender, but to help these women succeed. When they hear a woman is really great at her job but not liked, take a deep breath and ask why. We need to start talking openly about the flexibility all of us need to have both a job and a life. A couple weeks ago in an interview, I said that I leave the office at 5.30 to have dinner with my children, and I was shocked at the press coverage. One of my friends says she wasn't sure I could get more headlines if I had murdered someone with an ax. I told her I wasn't really interested in trying that. But this showed me that this is an unresolved issue for all of us, for men and women. Otherwise, why would everyone write so much about it? And maybe most importantly, we need to start talking about how fewer women than men, even from places like HBS, 
most likely even in this class, aspire to the very top jobs. We will not close the leadership gap until we close the professional ambition gap. We need more women, not just to sit at the table, but as President Obama said a few weeks ago at Barnard, to take their rightful seats at the head of the table. One of the reasons I was so excited to be here today is that Dean Noria told me that this year is the 50th, 50th anniversary of letting women into this class. Your dean is so passionate about getting more women into leadership positions, and he told me he wanted to speak, me to speak this year for that reason. I met a woman from that first class once. She told me that when they first came in, the first class of women, they took a men's room and converted it to a women's room, made sense, but they left the urinals in. She thought the message was super clear. We're not sure this whole girl thing is going to work out. And in case it doesn't, we won't have to reinstall the urinals. The urinals are long gone. Let's make sure that no one ever misses them. As you and your classmates spread out across the globe and walk across this stage tomorrow, I wish for you four things. First, that you keep in touch via Facebook. This is critical. <laughs> to your future success. And we're public now, so can you click on an ad or two while you're there? <laughs> two, that you make the effort to speak as well as seek the truth. Three, that you remain true to and open about your authentic self. And four, most deeply, that your generation accomplishes what mine has failed to do. Give us a world where half our homes are run by men and half our institutions are run by women. I'm pretty sure that would be a better world. I join everyone here in offering my most sincere congratulations to the class of 2012. With your authentic selves, give yourselves a huge round of applause.